Sabah, you can start. Yes, sir. You can start now. Okay. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everyone. Today we have our ECG basic and beyond session. Today's session is case-based studies on ECG. We first, uh, we have among us our international advisor, Professor Rafi Khamed Sir, Chaudhary Hafiz Hassan Sir, Professor Matahali Sir, Abdul Wadi Chaudhary Sir, and all other dignitary teachers. Before starting the program, I request Professor M. Atharali Sir to uh, say a few words about Kassan Nasrullah Sir and Muhammadullah mm -hmm. Fidel Sir, our presenters of today's session. Atharali Sir. Actually, uh, today we have started a new dimension of our sessions. At the beginning of the session, actually we want to express our deep sorrow and condolence for our uh, Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury's mother. She has expired few days back. And but with all this problem, Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury is still with us. Uh, I request, I like to request Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury to say something about uh, today's program. Professor Abdul Wadud Choudhury. Assalamu everyone. I'm very much grateful to everyone. So many people have shown their sympathy, paid their homage and condolence to me. My mother died three days ago. She was 90 years old. My father died in 1976. I was then 11 years old. We are six brothers and one sister. And my mother, she was a lady of sheer iron will and determination. She made sure that all of us have proper education. All of us grow up as a good human being. We have two engineers, two doctors, a pharmacist, a banker, a businessman, uh, a doctor, two teachers amongst us. And among doctors, that means I am PhD holders. And all this has been possible because of her determination. I'm really grateful that so many people have shown their respect to her. And she belongs to an era where the family values, the importance of education, the importance of being a good human being are given much more importance than only acquiring money or wealth or fame or name. And that's the teaching that she has instilled in us. Pray for her so that God Almighty give her Jannatul Fiddaus. And pray also for all of us, six brothers and one sister, so that our progeny can make ourselves proud. They can also become good human beings, not only successful, but good human beings, as my mother has been able to do with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary. And so, uh, again, uh, Professor Abdul Wadud Chaudhary, can we start the session today, uh, right now? Yes, please, please. Achha, please. Achha, do you want to, want to introduce? I, I, I request you to introduce Dr. Kaisa Dosrullah Khan and Muhammadullah Firuz to these two faculties. It's my pleasure. Uh, Kaisa and Firuz, both of whom uh, we have been uh, together since our student days. I was just a teacher. They were just a student at that time in NSABT. But uh, Firoz has been my student since MBBS 
third year. And Kaiser in post graduation. And both of them are very good student, very good physician, very inquisitive, and very much eager to challenge and to learn, to think otherwise, to dare uh, to ask questions. These are the hallmarks that has made them quite different from others. Kaisal Nasrullah Khan, a very good interventionist, very fearless interventionist, I would say, who has done the first retrograde uh, intervention, corona intervention in this country. And Firoz, he is a born teacher. And he likes to teach. And in that regard, he's very successful. Today, we are going to enjoy their presentation. I hope I am uh, like each and everybody are very much waiting what surprises they will pull to us. Thank you. Dr. Firoz. Hello, Firoz. Hello. Sir. Sir, let us make a plan as because uh, Dr. Hafiz Bhai is busy. So let us start with uh, Dr. Kaisar Nasrullah, then we'll, uh, uh, we'll invite uh, 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 Dr. <coughs> Uh, Hafiz, then you. Okay, sir. The sequence will be uh, Kaiser Nasrullah, then Hafiz Bhai, then Mahmoudullah Firoz, and finally the Rubik sir. So I can, uh, you can uh, plan like this. So you can invite Dr. Kaiser Nasrullah Khan as a first speaker. Uh, I request Kaiser Nasrullah Khan for his speaker. Uh, we can see your screen. Uh, can you make it louder, please? A bit louder, your voice. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, not low, sir. Not very distinct. Okay, let's see. Um, am I audible now? Uh, not that much. Can you use any headphone or like this? Headphone I don't have. Anyway, I, I, then I, I will speak loud. I'm, I, I'm okay. very sorry that I, uh, uh, I don't have headphones today. I said, can you hear that? Can you hear that? Okay. Problem with that. Can you mute it? No, no. I'm not going to start checking to keep money. I do jury will take all the fight. I'm going to ask the answer. Uh, because you're applying a MacBook is good to send. No, no, MacBook, no, MacBook, not a clear show. It's HP. Now, 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 now better. Now, better. Okay, okay, okay. Sound to the hand. Sound is volume to the sound output. I mean, I mean, highest DC. I can show it. I can better. It's much better. It's better. It's better. It's better. It's better. It's better. It's Assalamu alaikum and uh, um, good evening to all. My uh, deepest condolence and regards to the mother of Professor Odud Ahmed Chaudhry. Uh, I would say uh, sh uh, she is a, a wonderful woman because she is known by uh, her uh, sons and daughter. And we, we, are, we are privileged to know one of his sons, Professor Odud Chaudhry, who is a versatile cardiologist, doctor, good human being. A tremendous teacher who taught me, who taught us all, and who shared his uh, with, with a passion for for teaching for juniors. So, in the Nilai Vainel Arjun, may Allah bless her Janna. And and thanks to ECG Group uh, for inviting me. Though I am not an ECG guy, but as Adarabai told me a few days back, I said uh, uh, he said me to show to ECG. And 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 uh, I have just collected two ECG, a very simple one. Uh, but let's start. Let's start. So uh, I've been asked to show two ECG. I picked up one ECG, which is a very simple one. Uh, you can all see this is twelve list EKG, and and um, so any comments on this? 
this patient uh, presented to me uh, with chest pain and and hypotension and and, and uh, also when he was in cardiac shock sir why you can go for slide show mode and with good slide show mode yes acha eta amake diye dilo okay so okay uh, okay uh, i thought it would be discussion in any anyway um uh, anyway then then uh, when we find an ecg we can see it's a clear cut case of inferior mi st up in 2 3 avf and when you, when you find this type of this ekg and and there is a hypotension uh, usually uh, if the lung bases are clear we we think of another diagnosis and we all know that thing that we have to take in um, a right sided lead and when you took a right sided lead we, we especially focus on v3 v4 where if you found that 1 mm ecg uh, st elevation we, we diagnose it as an uh, rv infraction and and for rv infraction with inferior mi we should be uh, to look for this ekg uh, especially we don't we don't look for it we, we might miss it because if in inferior mi 25 30% is are associated with rv infraction so this is a 12 mm ecg Uh, uh showing acute mi infer with right ventricular infarction and we we know there is some exception of qf in lead trees um and it is really an isolated phenomenon it is usually associated with infer mi and uh, the incidence of right ventricular infarction is lower due to smaller mass of right ventricle lower within right ventricular wall which are collateral suppression of right ventricle and for ekg diagnosis in the setting of ami inferior we should take a v3 v4 r uh, ecg as a lead where if you found st elevation more than 1 mm we can make this diagnosis and 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 even after, uh, without that to see in the setting of ami inferior that st elevation and pure leads mimicking anterior mi but here there is gradual decrease of uh, um, from right to left and we suspect rv infarction and st elevation in v1 and with st depression in v2 this corded relationship to think of rv infarction and and some points to ponder that um if we found um this visually associated with hypertension in case jvp and again with clear lung lung base and and to diagnose this we should be careful because we need to raise the jvp and right ventricular load to maintain the cardiac output and at that time we, we gave a very fast normal saline 2 to 3 liter to maintain the pulmonary uh, 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 jvp 18 to 20 mm mercury we use inotrop like dopamine and we, we should do reperfusion or primary pci we should also to use um, um dopamine and morphine uh, sorry morphine and Uh, nitrates because they make the um, hypertension more, but most of them spontaneously improve within 40 to 70 hours after acute. Event. So this is one ECG I've shown now, and now I will uh, show you um, a case two. Uh, Kaiser, I think uh, we should discuss this ECG first. The, uh, the okay. number. number one ecg first and i think we should discuss the ecg diagnosis then the management part okay so, sir can you go to the ecg yeah can you show the ecg okay sir can you predict yeah. from this ecg what coronary that is either but uh, which was the culprit vessel from this ecg can you predict yeah yeah um when you culprit artery I think it's RCA. So, so any comments, Fios? Uh, you can enter uh, the family. I'm going to do some ECG uh, for localization of the culprit artery. In fact, in this ECG of Kaiser Bay, it is definitely inferior MI, and with RV infarct, most likely the patient has got a proximal RCA lesion. Uh, that is the that is the 
uh, artery localization of this patient. This patient has got inferior MI, first degree heart block with um, RV infarct. So when inferior MI with RV infarct, we think that it is a proximal RC lesion. Rupik, sir. Hello, sir. Whether Rupik sir is here or not? Yes. Sir, let me see. Um, yes. I'll leave this discussion, yes. but uh, definitely right coronary. But the question is, there is ST elevation in V1 and V2. Um, so my, my question is, is there a possibility of involvement of the uh, LAD or not? Sir, I've got another question to you, sir. Sir, it is the RCA proximal lesion but there is no conduction defects. Is there any explanation, sir? Oh, the, so the question is um, right coronary artery, but you know, we see a lot of patients with inferior MI, they don't develop heart block. It is possible that the AB node is, some of them are supplied by the right coronary artery, some of them have dual supply, some by the uh, circumflex. So that is the reason that not all inferior MI microinfarction infarction patient develops heart block. So let's look at the uh, overall presentation of acute inferior ST elevation MI that we are talking here. So Marriott describes that if the two, three more than the AVF, there's maybe chances of left circumflex dominance is there. But I don't go too much into that and then whether there is any reciprocal changes in the precordial leads. And if the reciprocal change is proportionate, meaning two, three ABF, if the ST elevation two millimeter, and then same, then this is reciprocal. But if it is more than that, and you have dominant R wave, and then upright T, then is a posterior. And with infra posterior extension, it is reasonable to believe that the infarct size is big. And then you take the picture whether the patient is hypotensive or not. If the patient is hypotensive, there is involvement of RV infarct, and we can verify that D4. I tell the emergency room, don't waste your time by doing the right-sided lead and then call us. You can call us first because we have this issue with the dog to balloon time. But when the patient is hypotensive in the absence of nitro, which should be avoided anyway, we are in a bad situation. So inferior MI, few things to look at. One, that what is, what were the associated cardiogenic shock or not? What is the rhythm? Now, it, it all depends on RV in part, but the RV branch coming from where, which part? So that will determine, and Kaiser can tell us what he found in this case. And then the, the rhythm, I get worried if there is a tachycardia with RV in part, with, with the inferior infarct because it may affect, uh, particularly if the patient is in cardiogenic shock, uh, there may be pap muscle dysfunction or rupture, and there may be a mechanical complication with the inferior MI. So these are the global perspectives when we look at an EKG and then immediately think about the patient and correlate. Another important thing with the inferior MI that is it all we have, as Rafik Bhai mentioned, that is the, there is an, in this case, there is lead one and AVL has ST depression. Is there something disease going on in the other side? That is also important. And by rule, any inferior infarct presenting as a ST elevation, we always think about the differential that this is not nasty thing like ascending dissection going into RCA. And therefore, a, a cardiac auscultation, AI, and particularly if the patient is in mm -hmm. hypotension and shock, we immediately do a bedside echo, make sure that the root is good and there is no pericardial effusion. This, these are the things to always remember when we deal with this uh, ST elevation in the inferior leads. These are like very basics, and I think it should be in the brain stem, not in the cerebral cortex. Abhis bhai, the ST depression in lead 1 and AVL, whether these are reciprocal cells or due to the ischemia on the other side? 
it is difficult to say because reciprocal is normally we reserve for the precordial leads. And usually reciprocals are like horizontal ST depression type. Here you can see that it is a downsloping ST depressions in lead one and ABL. I don't want to read too much in the EKG. Uh, and uh, and uh, there is a suspicion that either this is a big RCA and uh, giving PL branches or there is a, a separate lesion in the circumflex OM. Oh, oh, the another important thing, why we do about this uh, EKG, because uh, dot to balloon time sometimes can be T20 cricket, because we have like in the lab, by the time we reach, it is 80 minutes and we have 10 minutes. So should we go with the diagnostic catheter on the other side and uh, Kaiser will appreciate that what I'm saying, or that we do diagnostic first, or we go up with the guide, because that's a couple of minutes can make a difference, you know, because I call it T20 cricket, because after 90 minutes, we miss it, and we'll be labeled as, you know, uh, in a binary way that dot to balloon time not achieved. So that becomes a problem then, so when I start in the lab, I check what is the time and what should we do, look at the EKG, and then go from there. I think uh, Wadud Bhai can make a comment. ST depression in lead one and ABL. Reciprocal or ischemia? Professor Wadud? There is ST lesion in inferior leads. If you got a depression, in particularly in AVL, look at the inferior wall, look at lead three, where the ST lesion is highest. And opposite to that is the AVL. And if it has the classical ST depression, it really su supports your diagnosis of acute ST limited MI. And you can rest assured that if you do the intervention or if you do the thrombolysis, whichever you prefer or is able to do, you will do much good to the patient. The problem here is the ST elevation in V1, V2. What does that suggest? One thing is that ST elevation in V1 as a whole is suggestive of in, in the uh, setting of acute inferior MI. is suggestive of uh, coexistent RV infarction. If the patient has hypotension and if it is not induced by nitrate or even induced by nitrate, both of these are very supportive of their diagnosis. Again, if the patient had atrial fibrillation, that will also suppose that sinus node artery is affected, right atrium is infected, that's why the patient is having atrial fibrillation. All those are suggestive of very proximal RC involvement. The second Sorry. Sorry. Is concomitant anterior uh, 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 infarction, sometimes the RV branch, the conus branch can be very big. It can su supply, uh, supply the anterior wall and thereby even with RP in, uh, sorry, RC involvement, we can have some uh, ST elevation in anterior leads, V1, V2. Atharvai, can I make a comment, please? Yeah, sure, sure, Atharvai, you're welcome. Yeah, uh, we, we just uh, uh, take notice that the precordial lead, some of the leads are recorded in half voltage. Uh, so there is a, uh, the R wave in... Uh, uh, lead 1 is uh, about 15 millimeter and AVL is more than 11 millimeter. So it, the, the patient might have some uh, left ventricular hypertrophy as well. And this may be uh, the, the changes in the 1 and AVL may be attributable to the hypertrophy. Left ventricular hypertrophy. There might be coexistent left ventricular hypertrophy as well. Because excellent, excellent observation, Khaled Bhai. Thank you very much. Professor, Sir, Professor Atahar. Yes, sir. Professor Atahar. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to make a comment that here there is a key wave in uh, three and also ABF, but not in lead two. Not in lead two. At the same time, uh, there is only B B one key wave, but in B two there is no key wave, only ST elevation, and uh, there is a deep ST depression in one and AVL. And 
can it be this ST elevation and V1 and V2, a reciprocal of changes of lead 1 and ABL? And if the blood pressure is not very low, then we cannot say it is a right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular infarction. Maybe a small um, inferior MI, but ST depression, whatever may be caused, maybe due to acute ischemia also in the 1 and ABL, and which may uh, lead to ST elevation, reciprocally in B1 and B2. In B2, there is no uh, Q wave, no definite infarction. Sir, in general, in general, whenever there is hypotension, we expect there should be sinus tachycardia. The only to ever place. Yeah, that's true. The, there is yeah. exception is when the patient have inferior MI without infarction, where we do not easily get the expected sinus tachycardia. That also says that this is the case of acute inferior MI. And mm -hmm. the patient was in hypotension. Kaiser, what was the pressure? It was uh, 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 80 by 40, something like that. Yes. Uh, and and another, ask the uh, panel about the precordial lead. Uh, another cause of ST, uh, hypotension. Another cause of hypertension maybe due to acute ischemic change in the um, uh, in, um, lateral wall because one and ABL, there is deep ST depression. This may not be reciprocal from um, inferior MI. This may be um, spasm or um, non ST in, in, in the uh, in, uh, lateral wall, left lateral wall. To echo with Professor Jalaluddin's comments, uh, let me tell you one thing though. We all know that the, the pure RV infarct is very rare. Most of the time when we see RV infarct, yes. about, there is some involvement of the posterior wall of the LV. So, and, and therefore you always look at whether there is an ischemic MR or not. But let me ask you one thing that the ST segment elevation in the precordial lead like V1, V2, if that is the only thing this patient presented with, do you have called yes. it ST elevation MI in the anterior? Uh, this is the question actually. This, this is this is okay. question. Uh, um, um, my opinion is that because there is uh, in addition to the inferior MI, there is gross ST depression in B1 and uh, lead one and AVL. And uh, for that, the reciprocal ST elevation may be in B1 and B2. That may be separate entity from other than the uh, inferior MI. Sir, actually, uh, uh, this As is... Depression in anterior leads, there should be reciprocal changes, ST depression in inferior leads. That is not the case. Yeah, and the other thing is that um, there is a term called uh, distant ischemia, yeah. but ischemia itself, so when we call reciprocal, from transmural injury pattern in one area, the reflection of ST changes in the opposite area is defined as the reciprocal change, if it is proportionate. If there is more than proportionate, then it is additional ischemia. But ischemia in one area does not give reciprocal ST elevation in the other area. That is not the case. So we'll have to take this ST elevation independently, whether this is a true reflection of something going in that territory or not. Uh, and my, my, my vote is that that alone in this case does not fulfill the criteria of the ST elevation to call for anterior wall MI if this patient comes in. However, however, the clinical story is more important because we call a STEMI on the basis of interpretation of the EKG and the patient. So we'll have to take this together. I think... Uh, sir, may I add a comment, sir? Yeah, Asad Zawan, yes, welcome Asad Zawan. Sir, I have seen that there is a, uh, one important term is uh, in case of RV infarction is the disproportionate elevation of ST segment in V1. If we consider the ST segment in V1 and V2, we can see here that the ST elevation more in V1 than that of the V2. It indicates there is RV infarction, no doubt. Number one issue, sir. 
Uh, second issue is if there is a uh, type 4 LED. In that cases, there may be ST elevation in V1 and V2. At the same time, there may be the ST elevation in the infrared LED as well. I have two comments are here. So I think uh, excellent Upper discussion. Way. Otherwise, uh, may I add a little thing? Aja, you are the last man to comment. Yes, welcome, okay. Javil. I have seen a case. I, I did angiogram in that case with this uh, type of uh, ECG. Who had PDA can was con continued. The LED hooked around the apex and went up to the crux. So it's a long uh, LED that covers up to the crux in the inferior surface of the heart. And there was no PDA from the right side. It, uh, it was uh, from the LED, not from LCX also. So in that case, this scenario may, might come, and it's a very rare occasion. Thank you. Uh, can I add something? Hello? Oh, yeah, you are very welcome. Uh, the point is, if it goes the wraparound LED, you would expect to have ST elevation more in lead 2. Here, lead 2 is almost non-involved. Right. So, uh, excellent discussion and Kaiser Nasrullah, thank you I'm very done. much for your B2 ECG, but, but uh, we want to give a message to our participants that there are some excellent discussion. We have to carefully notice all the things as because there is ST elevation in V1 and V2, ST depression in lead 1 and lead 2 and also Khaled Mahashan has also noticed there is standardization, there is a half standardization in the pre cordial lead. So all the points we have to notice, but finally we have to give, these are all the points we have to discuss. But I have, we have to finally come to a conclusion for the management of the purpose. An excellent discussion. We have to, this is the beauty of the discussion that we have to see all the things. And for our participants, that is we have to make a final clinical diagnosis for the management of the patient. That was the inferior infarction with RV involvement with the, uh, that is the cardiogenic shock. This is the diagnosis, Kaiser Nasrullah. Yes, yes. So, so I, let I, us come. I see a proximal lesion. So, so, come to the management uh, management aspect. How did you manage this patient? Did you put the patient in the cath lab or is the conservatively managed? I, I, I definitely took him to cath lab, but I, 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 I put him lots of you know uh, normal saline, like two liter, very running, and took him to uh, with dormant support. I took him to cath lab, and, and there is a RC proximal lesion with lots of thrombus i need to suck it out and, and then after after a while i put a stand and led and sark has got non-significant lesion it was not free of disease uh, and and what i've i've emphasized that you have to we have to give a normal salad running two to three liter to keep the jvp uh, 15 to 18 mm and also dormant support to to combat uh, to make the rv output more keep the lv output so uh, that's the, my key message to the juniors that uh, seek for RV infarction when you're dealing with the inferior MI ACG. And if you find any, then then give uh, um, normal saline running, give dopamine, keep the RV output higher by stretching the RV wall. Uh, and then if uh, whatever you do, if, you, if, if possible, to, uh, take for primary PCI, if not possible, thrombolize the patient. That's my message. I try to keep, avoid nitrous and morphine in this case. Second is the case. Echo was good, right, Kaiser? Echocardiogram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. LV function normal, no mitral regard. Uh, no, 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 no regard, no regard. LV, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I, but I think it was near normal, 40 to 50 percent maybe. Yeah. But, but, but no MR, no regard. Second, this is the guy, sir. So I just want yeah, to I, add one thing. I'm to done. Kaiser's I'm comment done. about the management. The RV with all these, what Kaiser said, you give fluid and all that. and But then it does not get better. And if it is a delayed presentation, the RV doesn't get better. So what do you do then? Uh, it is it, it becomes a very challenging. One thing we all cardiologists should ap appreciate that RV is kind of a neglected chamber. If RV goes down, the whole cardiology goes down. It's very difficult. It is, it is in good news that RV is resilient. It comes back if you can give the support. But during the supportive phase, 
if the RV does not get better, then RV failure is a big problem. So you can then, what do you do then? And, and what do you do then? So some has tried inotrope, digoxin, but if that doesn't work, then you need to think about reassessing, make sure there is no mechanical complications, do a right heart, look at the PAPI, a pulmonary a, a pulsatility index. If the PAPI is low, you need to give RV support. Is there any uh, choice? How do you do that? How do you do the RV support, Hafiz Bhai? Can you please clear yeah. this point? So, so to, one is the a dire situation is you go to give RV impella, right? And, and, and the other one is that you uh, uptight it with your pressors because you, you need, because if the volume becomes a problem. Volume helps you in the beginning, but now the RV is dilated and failing, then if you give volume, it's not going to work because the RV cannot take this high preload anymore. So if, if you're giving fluid and the uh, RA pressure or the CVP is going higher, high, high now 2024 and RV is not working, then it becomes a problem. So you need to back off, give the, and, and leave with the lower cardiac output as you can. And that becomes a problem. And that is why Professor Jalaluddin's comment is very important. That is the ILV in, involved as well. Because if the right heart will tell you, if the wedge is normal, then you have more room to give fluid. But if the wedge is also high and the RA pressure is also high, then you know that you are in a bad situation. You are dealing with both left-sided and right-sided failure. If that is the case, then it becomes a little bit easier. You can try LV support and then see. But you need to calculate the cardiac out power output and the PAPI and see only LV support will work or you need both LV and RV impel. That becomes complicated. I usually do in this situation, I start doing hemodynamics and I, I uh, Eric uh, from uh, Heart Failure Transplant Center uh, and then communicate with them how to do it. What is your, Hafiz Bhai, what is your usual practice in your center? That is, do you do the invasive monitoring in all the cases of the RV infarction? Uh, invasive monitoring is uh, two ways, right? The, if the patient is not cardiogenic shock, then I don't do the, uh, I don't do the uh, right heart as a routine. But if the patient is cardiogenic shock, we do, we do invasive, yes. Second ECG, Rufik sir. Uh, it is sir, uh, can, I, can you show the second ECG? But no, before, no, no. yeah, uh, Refuge, to... I, I, I am done. You start with you, you supply. Ah, no I... problem. Then you can invite Hafiz by Firoz. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. May may I request Professor uh, Hafiz sir to show his ECG. Hafizar, before before Hafizar starts his presentation, this is one important thing what Hafizar is saying that giving fluid, you cannot give fluid without any any limitation because uh, this fluid in the RV works by Frank Sterling law, and that works within a certain limit of volume. If you process that volume, then the uh, this extra amount of fluid will lead to extra burden on the RV and it will increase the RV failure. So giving fluid uh, without any limit is not a, a good idea for RV infarction. We can see Hafiz by screen. screen. Hafiz sir, please. Slide share mode. Officer, we can uh, hear you. Slide share. Can you see my slide? No. Yes, all the slides. Slide. All the slides. But okay. in a slide sorter mode, you can go for slide show mode. Yeah. 
as long as okay good 60 year old male post resuscitation found unconscious and we always ask what is the first rhythm observed first rhythm observed is the pa cpr acls protocol rosc field intubation no name and this is the vitals when the patient arrived in the hospital and this is the ekg i would request you to look at the ekg first and then i will request you to look at the strategies that you would follow so look at the ekg first this is a little noisy ekg sorry for that uh, We can we can see your ECG. Cannot cannot see. We are still seeing your first slide. Yeah. You can't see our my EKG. Yes, can. Yes. Can. I can see. Okay. Okay. And do you see the uh, suggestions, uh, the 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 answers like the follow following Rafik Bai's uh, sort of presentation? Uh, suggestions A, therapeutic hypothermia protocol. supportive care correct metabolic derangements b immediate angiography revascularization hemodynamic support c rewarming and supportive care and correct metabolic derangements and d temporary pacing supportive care and correct metabolic derangements maybe you can arrange poll just few minute a few seconds and then poll Sir, I think they will not be able to arrange poll at this very moment. They are not ready. Sir, okay. we can start. Will Will we start? Yes, yes, you can, can answer. Start. Go for poll. Okay, okay, starting, sir. I'm starting the controversy, so I'm very curious to see. We have about hundred participants. I see. Uh, what is the temperature of that patient? That is that, that is that's a part of the ECG interpretation. Sir, so should we go for twenty seconds or thirty seconds? Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Okay. Okay, we can stop it now. So seventeen out of seventy-six voted for it. Forty-one percent says it's C, rewarming and supportive care. And correct metabolic rate. B and C. Atharva's last comment increased the poll to the democratic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so any comment by uh, anyone? As a looks like a was born noem. As a final comment from Rupik sir, but before that, uh, from panelist. Yes, Atharva. Probably this patient had. received therapeutic hypothermia as a management protocol of cardiac arrest and the the effect of hypothermia is visible on the ecg the, uh, no, the but, but, but just telling khalid mohsin this is immediately after arriving in the hospital this ecg oh, okay okay so, no, i thought yeah. it after after, the, after resuscitation and, and, yeah and then and, and as you know that we don't do the uh, therapeutic hypothermia the uh, We, we follow the mild mild protocol now we don't do the uh, aggressive hypothermia protocol and uh, osborne way following therapeutic hypothermia then we are in deep trouble acha habib bhai yeah first of all let us make the ecg diagnosis first what is the ecg yes. diagnosis yes what any bhai? comment any habib comment what is what is the ecg diagnosis or jamil what is the issue we got involved uh, cardiology got involved because the, the emergency room physician called it stemi so that's and then that's why i was involved 
this ECG actually shows there is bradycardia, profound bradycardia, and it is sinus rhythm as most of the complexes are preceded by P waves. There is a ST elevation in the inferior lids, this 2, 3, and IVF with concavity upwards. And uh, uh, as well as in the uh, lateral lids in lid V6, V5, V6. So, uh, and in AVR, there is ST depression, convexity upward. This my one feature, this may be uh, pericarditis maybe uh, due to prolonged resuscitation and uh, STEMI should be ruled out. But this is the ECG of a patient that is a cardiac arrest survivor, true? Yes. Sir. Why? Yes. Cardiac, that is, that, is, that is, this is the ECG of a patient who has just survived from the cardiac arrest. So STEMI, should... STEMI is a uh, very uh, pro probable diagnosis. So that is the dilemma, right? If it is a STEMI and you are buying that, then you need to go to the cath lab right. yeah. or do something. Sir, may I add one point, sir? Yes, sir. Sir, may I add, sir? Yes. Yeah. Sir, yeah. sir, actually, there is a, uh, on the background of uh, sinus bradycardia, there is RBB morphology. And this RBB morphology is an important issue here due to the uh, it may be whether there is a Brugada or not, is, I, it's not clear to me yet, but there's a, another important finding is that there is a RBB is here. Probably on this comment, I would not entertain Brugada here. And well, uh, I mean, RBB is not here. Yeah. The RSR pattern is not there in V1 and uh, uh, R wave is small in S1. Rupik, sir. So I tell you what happened here because for the sake of time, otherwise. No, Actually, no. No, we will just hear the uh, final comment from the Rupik, sir. But before doing, that is the uh, that is the STM is the first diagnosis, but early. No, 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 no. This is the reason I'm showing this. We need to take this STEMI, ST elevation MI. There is ST elevation, but there is no MI here. We need to understand that. And I right away this, I right away deactivated this MI part. Couple of things to follow. The patient was resuscitated from the field. Patient was hypothermic. Otherwise, to answer your right. first question, right. I deliberately did not give you the temperature in the vitals. Um, and I think your comment uh, increased the number of correct answers. Right. <laughs> and and then and then the the if you are in doubt. This is a transmural MI if you want to explain this because of the cardiac arrest. But the first rhythm was PA. Usually with the MI, the, the ACLS protocol, first rhythm is v um, So there's a few things. And then two things you can do before you take to the cath lab. You can do a bedside echo and see what is the LV function and whether there's any regional wall motion. And then even after that, if you cannot decide, I would request that I usually do, I buy time. I tell the ER physicians that it doesn't look like MI to me, but this patient is resuscitated. Before you take to the cath lab, another important thing we learn, because if we are in doubt, even Brugard I have taken to the cath lab and then found nothing. Um, sometimes we get burned, but you buy time and see. One principle we follow, Nasrullah is here, we take to the cath lab and Khaled Mohsin is here. Nowadays, diagnostic cath is very safe. So some will say, what is the harm in taking to the cath lab and find out? There is harm. There is harm because this patient is sharp. The pH it was actually 6.9. The potassium was high. Calcium was low, totally metabolically deranged. And, and the creatine importantly was high and patient also had rhabdo. We found out later. So if you give contrast, can I can I Hafiz, can I make a comment? Yeah. So this is a patient from Las Vegas, right? Yeah. And who had no names. Yeah. So this is a homeless person lying on the street side. Yeah. For no question about it, because 
In America, either you are home, people will know who you are, or if they find me on the street, they will find my wallet, I should have a name. So this patient was lying on the, probably on the street side for several hours before they found him, is that true? We don't know, but we are guessing the same way you are yeah. thinking. Okay, all right. So we did not do any um, intervention or any angiogram. Patient was intubated, did poorly, and, uh, and ultimately uh, we could not save him, he passed away a uh, couple of days later. But LV but, function was normal. And okay. the troponin, troponin was actually low. The CPK was high. It's like 30,000 plus. And, and it is very well known that you can have these ST changes with the hypothermia. So I'm just uh, trying to get this in the mind of our juniors that there are several differential of ST elevation, but for calling it a STEMI, you will have to have two parts, ST elevation and a MI part. So this is a good one and I'll finish soon. 69 year old, this is a debate. I'm, I'm admitting that it's still controversy going on with this patient, so don't kill me. So 69 year old, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, renal failure, cellulitis, peripheral vascular disease. Presented to us with tachycardia, blood pressure was 70. So when there is a white complex tachycardia and hypotension, I pray to God that this is hypotension so we can shock. We don't need to think twice. Uh, but that's not the right way to think. And that's why Rafik Bhai is here to sort it out. Question is, what is the diagnosis of this white complex tachycardia? I gave you all the risk factors. And this is subsequent EKG. Ah, you should not have shown this one. No, no, Rafik Bhai, Rafik Bhai, Rafik Bhai. I'm showing you, you have deliberately. Go back. I'm no, no, and then you I'm showing you even more. And I'm showing you even more. Okay. Now, my question to you is this. Your diagnosis of the initial rhythm, A, VT, I forgot to put A, B, C, D. Is it VT, left bundle branch block and sinus tachy, left bundle branch atrial flutter, left bundle branch block atrial fibrillation? Okay. Let the audience remember this sequence and call it one, two, three, four, and let's go back to the first ECG. Yeah, first ECG is the, is the yes. yes. Can you go back, please? Okay. So A was VT, B was left bundle branch block with sinus tack. C was left bundle branch block with a flutter, and D left bundle branch block with atrial fibrillation. Okay, so Ravik Bhai, um, okay. VT is 44%, and then left bundle branch sinus tack second. Let me show you further. Um, no, 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 no. You have to go back. Okay. Oh. I wanted I to give you the floor. No, you cannot because you see, when I have the patient, I just have this ECG. So the patient is sitting in front of me with a systolic pressure of 70 and I have all, all I have is this ECG. Yes. And all of the audience that is listening to this lecture, they are sitting in the emergency room with a patient with systolic pressure of 70, and this is the ECG. They don't have any more information, and they will have to make a decision based on this. Yeah. And our yeah. panelists need to help the audience to tell them what is the diagnosis. So any, 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 any panelists, any comment on this? Khaled Mohsin, welcome. Rhythm strip, one, two, three, four. The fifth beat. Sir, why? The QS compass rate is around 50. Wadud is talking, Wadud. Wadud, uh, uh, just increase your volume, please.
uh, I considered I did the cap, no coronary disease, and then EF was 30%, but I also did right heart. Anyone to comment on the right heart? Hafiz, how did yeah. the rate come down? Rate came down MEO. Yeah. After did shock? Did, no. Now after just one second. Shock. shock. This is shock. Synchronized shock. You shocked and the rate come, came down, right? Yeah. Was there any change in morphology of the QRS complex before and after the shock? Okay, so that's why I showed you the uh, subsequent uh, aftershock. This is the EKG. <laughs> no, yes. So okay. the, the, the problem is this ECG and uh, ECG during the tachycardia is not much of a difference. And I think no. your diagnosis no. is correct. It's, yes. It was supraventricular. It's yeah. probably actual flutter with two to one conduction with a rate exactly. of 150. Exactly, but everybody was in on my nerves uh, and then patient is not doing well. So I ended up doing this gap because I don't want to uh, to be blamed that I'm not doing anything. So, and then I gave minimum dye, but I did the hemodynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this is the right heart cap, any comment? So now the ICU versus cardiology. Uh, CCU, is it is it your patient or my patient? Cardiogenic shock or septic shock? What was the procal centrinine level? Was that procal? LBDP. You are asking me hard questions. I don't know. I'll have to look up. <laughs> what was the Hafiz? What was the SBR? Okay, so. Actually, I did not give SVR. I wanted to uh, the audience to, to learn about how to do SVR calculation. Um, but in any case, uh, if anybody has any comment. Uh, uh, the LBDP is high, 24. Yes. That was in favor of uh, left heart failure. Or it's a CCU case. Yeah. Waste pressure is also high. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So... We have to accept that this is a cardiogenic shock, right? Because the EDP is high, cardiac index is at, on the fence, yes. wedge pressure, wedge pressure is high. There is no mitral stenosis, and then PA pressure is moderately elevated, okay. uh, and 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 therefore we'll have to accept that this is cardiogenic shock with poor uh, stroke volume. So uh, and the SVR calculated was also high. Um, and I request everybody to, you know, learn this, uh, how to do fit cardiac output and also how to calculate the SVR because the blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times SVR. If you know the cardiac output, you should be able to get the SVR and SV for that, you need to have the two ends of the uh, circulation. The map is 60, RA pressure is 10, so 50. Okay. Yeah. Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. We are assuming that everybody knows SVR. Um, I, I didn't know it many years ago. Can you explain why you are using SVR? What is the term for? So, systemic vascular registers, right? Right. Can so, you explain it in layman's term, please, to us? So, the systemic, we have two circulation. One is systemic circulation, one is pulmonary circulation. Systemic circulation is determined by the pressure on two ends, which is the mean arterial pressure and the right arterial pressure. And the pulmonary circulation is determined by two ends. One is the pulmonary circulation map, pulmonary mean arterial pressure, and the wedge pressure. These are the two ends. So if you look at the Ohm's law, the resistance will be by the flow flow and the pressure in two ends. Therefore, if the map is 60, in the systemic circulation, two ends, mean arterial pressure minus the right arterial pressure is 50. You divide that by the flow, you get the resistance. And that resistance is in UD unit. You need to, you know, that's the way we express. You need to multiply that by 80. Then you get the times. Okay. And let me ask, okay. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So, what is normal systemic vascular resistance? So you take anywhere between 800 to 1200. 
Okay, fine. Day. So let's say there is a patient, Mr. Johnson. His yeah. systemic vascular resistance is 800. And within next six months, he developed severe cardiomyopathy. And in heart failure, what will happen to his systemic vascular resistance? Excellent question. The vast majority of the patients with heart failure, when they decompensate, their SVR goes high. And that becomes a problem because now the pump that is already weak is, is actually acting against a higher afterload. What, and that is why, an undesirable. Okay. Why, will the, why does systemic vascular resistance go up in a heart failure patient? Because body tries to maintain the BP. The blood pressure okay. determines the organ perfusion. Okay. So if the cardiac output falls, the SVR goes up to compensate, to get the blood pressure good. Okay. And that's the so, usual cycle. Okay, so now let's make an assumption. So there is another person, Mr. Johnson, has no cardiac problem, developed severe sepsis. His systemic vascular resistance will go down, right? Yes. Okay. So instead of 800, he will be like 200. Yes. So that's how we will differentiate between cardiogenic shock and septic shock. Now let's take Mr. Johnson. I just wanted to add one thing with your observation. One of the cheaper way to look at a patient and monitor SVR is to look at the diastolic blood pressure in the ward round every day. If somebody is febrile and drop blood pressure, if you see that the diastolic blood pressure was 70, now 40, and there is no anemia, there is no shunt, nothing, and the patient is febrile, you know that the SVR went down with the fall in the diastolic blood pressure because okay. SVR maintains the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, now I'm going to give you another scenario, Hafiz. You have to help me out here. So Mr. Johnson, whose ejection fraction is 15%, yeah. and his normal SVR range was 800, now it's 1800. Yes. And he developed septic shock. Yes. What will happen to his systemic vascular resistance? Yes, and that is the situation where we need to collaborate with the ICU guys, right? So I say this, that sometimes sepsis helps in the heart failure, but not for too long, because sepsis will try to reduce the SVR, and because of the reduced SVR, suddenly the it will be convenient for the myocardium because the afterload has gone down. It will recruit more myocardium depending on what kind of contractile reserve you have. If you have good contractile reserve, you will be able to overcome this. But if you have bad contractile reserve, you will may be able to get a little better at the beginning, but soon you, it will crumble. And then SVR will no longer be, be low. It will, it will start going high. And, and another compounding factor, with the overwhelming sepsis, you have the myocardial depression factors, LB function, contractile function will go down. And as we go from the warm phase of sepsis to the poor phase, SVR is going to skyrocket and doomsday will arrive. So okay. unless we monitor hemodynamically these patients carefully, and titrate that way, we are not going to do it. All right, thank you. This is good, Abhid. Uh, can I say something? You have given Lebofet to the patient. What will do to the SVR in this patient? Okay, so uh, <laughs> this is an important question. So Lebofet is going to give you the contractile function a little better because remember, this is beta agonist, but it is going to increase your afterload as well because SVR is go going to be a little high. So this, you use your judgment. Is this SVR 1300 acceptable to you or, or it, it, is, it, it is already high? And your goal is to keep the blood pressure, right? Now, you can do a couple of things. You can give milrinone, for example, in this situation. If you think that the SVR is high and your feeling pressure is also high, then milrinone is a better choice. 
But if you only rely on milrinone, uh, you will also take the risk of arrhythmias because milrinone is very bad. So you titrate with whatever way you can, give little bit of levofit, little bit of uh, milrinone, and then keep the maintained blood pressure and organ perfusion. Particularly key thing is to keep urine out. But that's a very uh, important question, Vadu. Now, if you giving level of fat and escalating the dose of the pressors, you know that you are not going to be able to continue. In that situation, and there are now plenty of data that as you escalate your doses, the prognosis is bad. And you calculate your you know, cardiac power output and then you go for devices. That means then, that means then LP unloading will be the much more helpful thing. In the Absolutely. Case. Absolutely. You're and absolutely right. ECMO will do the job more, much yeah, more. Well, I honestly don't think that ECMO is a very good afterload or LV unloading because LV unloading, ECMO is good in general, is for gas exchange. Mm -hmm. Gas exchange, ECMO. But for LV unloading, and this will be a, like a debate with bloodshed that why you are saying this. But I'm telling you my two cents. ECMO, good for gas exchange, for LV unloading, Impella or equivalent. So, Firoz? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, we missed Rofixel ECG for last few weeks. Now we can go for Rofixel's presentation, sir. So, sir, uh, Rofixel, uh, I would suggest Rofixel that this type of patients, we should have more discussion again and again in future because in our country we do not actually monitor the patient hemodynamically we are not accustomed to it but if you have the basic knowledge from this type of examples our young uh, cardiologist will be much more inclined to do that in future what well, so, the excellent point and now we have these five french swan guns catheters i'm telling you it is so easy actually to put a float as one, uh, but it, it, in the US, we are also a little reluctant because it does not give much money, but it helps a lot of information. Afiz uh, Bhai, just a small question. Uh, uh, that uh, can we use like, like sometimes I, 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 I use for a, when I, I do a, do a PTC of a low EF patients, a, a multi-purpose or uh, you know, pulmonary balloon catheters, uh, normal, not swan gas, not swan gas, uh, the pulmonary balloon catheters to measure the, uh, the PA pressures and give nitro to reduce uh, the, the difference between the arterial blood pressure and pulmonary uh, arterial pressure while doing the PTCA. It's, it's, it's sort of a poor man's swan gas, what, what I believe. You comment. So if you, if you do that, you look at the pulmonary arterial diastolic blood pressure because yeah. pulmonary artery diastolic blood pressure has a good correlation with wedge. And wedge is a reflection of LV EDP. When you do angioplasty, you are actually making things worse with ischemia. And when there is ischemia, the EDP is going to go high. If you want to monitor that, then that's not a bad idea to do. But if you want to do real proper, you know, that these are things to, that will happen. But if you really need a proper monitoring, you're probably better off with the five French swan to put in. I normally don't do any routine PA catheter and LB dysfunction patients. I usually go for supportive thing because you may need a coronary perfusion uh, with the balloon pump. I call it coronary perfusion help. Uh, but if you really need to unload the ventricle, then you need impella with the lower uh, like a CP or 2.5, 3.5 cardiac output. But depending on what you want to do, a coronary perfusion help or coronary. ventricular unloading, because you know that monitoring is helpful, but you know that that's going to happen. All right. Uh, good, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. I think now we'll come back to simpler life. So my simplicity is my <laughs> motto. 
So please start thinking simple. Don't think of level fed, all those complex things. So uh, first TCG, um, this one. Look at it a few seconds and then we'll give the poll and then um, we- Big we people don't know you. You have a benign face, but you actually challenge more. <laughs> But I have an interesting ECG, Hafri is the one that you showed, left bundle with two different width QRS complex. So for some reason, I had a similar ECG today. We will look at it. Could we start the poll? Yes, please. Okay. can stop now. 52% says it's B, sinus rhythm. Yeah. So I, I would it? like Wadu to comment on choice D, which is 10% say D. Uh, Wadu, can you tell us something about it? Yes, that the answer is, is speaks volume because it was saying biphasic T in lead three. And we know that for ST segment or T wave changes in only one lead, I'm not going to pay attention to that. So this is a very important point. Thank you, Wadud. Very important point that we saw, yes, I am describing that finding and I did it on purpose that there is biphasic T wave in lead three. But if it was abnormal, it would also have shown in lead to an AVF, which it did not. So if we find this kind of isolated change, and that's why I have these two choices here, that number three and number four. Uh, one I said normal ECG, other is abnormal ECG. So it's, it's an actually normal ECG. I, I'm describing the finding. We should describe mm -hmm. all these findings. So, but I think overall, uh, uh, this is excellent. I mean, if we say sinus rhythm, uh, normal ECG, that's an acceptable choice. Uh, sinus rhythm, uh, whoever noticed the sinus arrhythmia actually paid attention to the beginning of the EKG. You see, beginning is a little bit faster and towards the end, little in the middle is a little slower and then faster. So it's a very subtle sinus arrhythmia and thank you for picking it up. So thanks. So this is good. I think this is a success that 90% of our audience um, answered correctly that this is basically a normal ECG. So I'm going to the next one. Um, again, simple ECG. Um, we're doing basic stuff. We can give the poll now. Okay, I think the poll is complete, right? Right, sir. Yeah, so um, uh, well, good news, nobody called it left bundle bind. So that's good. So, but one person called it a normal ECG, um, which is fine. I mean, it looks fairly benign, but if you look at lid V1, there's an M pattern and the QRA duration is wider. So that takes away the normal part and why it is abnormal. And the question is, is it incomplete or complete right bundle branch block? And I, 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 I think I'm willing to accept both answers because it's a little difficult to see the grid here. Uh, also the issue of left tendon enlargement I added. So let's look at the next ECG. Um, 
if you look at it, I actually increased the grid size. I enlarged it. And if you look carefully here, it's about 110 milliseconds. It didn't go to three boxes. So that makes it incomplete. But if somebody said this is complete, I will not argue with that person also, because this is not really, really on the borderline, but it's incomplete by definition, incomplete. Um, Can you right go previous CCG? What is it? The uh, initial. When? This one, the initial ECG. Yeah, this is the first one. Uh, sir, uh, yeah. I, I want to draw attention to one thing. Sometimes people, uh, patients with right bundle branch block, they seem to have a key waves in inferior list. But if you look at it carefully, actually it's not key wave. Can I make a comment, please? Yes, do. Please do. Uh, actually, uh, can it be a case of pulmonary embolism because there is yes. a S1, 2, T3 and an incomplete RBBB? Come in motion. I was, that's why I was saying, they, that's why it, 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 it needs to be. Uh, we couldn't you. hear your comment. Yeah. Be a case of pulmonary embolism. There is the S1Q3T3 changes and incomplete RBBB. But in that case, sinus tech is usual. Sinus, sinus, sinus tech. tech. Yeah. <laughs> and no precordial changes as well. But uh, can, can it be in the differentials? Yes, definitely it should be in the differential diagnosis, but uh, I think unlikely as because there is no sinus tag. But that Q web, uh, as you were suggesting in lead three, that's the point I'm saying. Sometimes people, uh, sir, sir, apna ye admit ko tabe. Finish here. Yeah, I got uh, disconnected. Uh, can you share my see my screen or no? Uh, we cannot, sir. Uh, you have to share. Okay. It. Okay, I'm sharing it again. Okay, sir. Actor question was asked, which is okay. That RBBB, which no one is sure, my inferior leg, my name is just a QA bear. I'm not sure. I'm sure they confuse. Go to the data. Okay, that is MI. Okay, that is not. Can you do it? That is okay. That is why I said that S1 Q3 T3. That is pulmonary embolism with RBBB pattern. That is pulmonary embolism. That is differential diagnosis. I'm not sure. Definitely. But but what did the point that you made? If you look at my arrow. Even though it looks like a keyword, there is a tiny R wave there. So that's the part. It looks a little confusing, but you are absolutely right to, to point it out. And also, in lead three, it looks like a wide Q, but in lead two and AVF, it's fairly narrow. It does not fulfill that criteria of 40 milliseconds for the Q wave. But these are all the valid points to, to bring forward. Should we make any comment on the T wave, uh, lead three and AVF, T wave? What the, uh, sir, but I is it a job, sir? I am back. T O F lead three and F F. Uh, the important point is that the uh, T O F is inverted cl clearly in lead three and also partially in lead F F. Maybe there is some in fish chemia, but in persons R B B B very skeptical of accepting that as chemia. Good. So, how about this one? This is our computer, our BBB. Okay, the poll, please. This computer will be. This is, sir, this is the first time, 100% oh, Yes. Not yet. Yes. Police not to worry. Yes, yes, yes. yes. First degree we will also. But there is right axis deviation, suggesting there is also left posterior hemi block. And this is RBB with first degree hemi block. Is there a pacing? No. No, there is no pacing. There is no pacing, yeah. So I think this is very good that Right, but then Odo made a point that it's extreme right axis deviation that is possible right posterior fascicular block. So I'm going to move to another ECG. Um, let me see, I, I have it here. Um, this is an ECG, um, if you could. Um, 
show it and then poll. So what do, what do you think? Pretty good, right? Yeah, right, sir. I, I, I think it's basically a majority answered with right bundle branch block, anteroceptal MI uh, with infra MI. And a few missed the infra MI part. So it basically, when you look at a picture, look at the whole thing. I mean, it's like when you see a beautiful young girl on the street, I'm talking to the boys, uh, just don't look at the face, look at the whole, uh, whole person. So, <laughs> so you just get amazed. So uh, same with uh, uh, anybody. Uh, so I think looking at the global picture uh, is important. And so this is the right bundle, um, which you can see the key wave in. So this ECG, look at, I'm going to bring other ECG for the same patient. Look at this alternate. Bundle branch block and next QRS is wider. And that brings us to that ECG that Harvey showed. You know what we traditionally considered complete left bundle or complete right actually is not. There is some conduction still. And it here probably is an example that when the, it became wider, it is a true complete. And then what we got is a little narrower. So it can vary even without being the traditional diagnosis of um, complete and incomplete. And that can, could have explained the ECG that Hafi showed. Uh, it was kind of funny that I had this ECG uh, just uh, surreptitiously. Um, how about this one? By facial of the RDD LHD. Any of our panelists, any comments? So uh, majority answered number four, and then next was number three. Khaled Mohsin? Yes, number four is the most likely uh, diagnosis, actually. There is a clear cut uh, right bundle branch block with left anterior hemi block, and there is uh, poor R wave progression in the precordial lead. And there is also evidence of uh, left atrial enlargement. This is the most plausible uh, diagnosis is number four. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I so, want to put the attention of yeah. the course. Yes, Go ahead. Okay. Answer. The way we are answering, what is the rhythm? It's yes, sinus. Yes, Always pay attention to that. Yeah. Next, is there what is the QRS complex? It's RBPP with, because of the axis deviation, that should be that should have been left posterior vascular block. Uh, anterior. And anterior. Uh, left anterior uh, extreme axis division. But no, uh, this is uh, right axis division. Look at this. Extreme axis division. This Dr. Khaled, Dr. Khaled Mohsin, uh, the right axis division, uh, that is deep S1 and B, uh, lead 1, is due to RBB. Uh, 
This is not actually right exit. So RBB doesn't deviation. The exit deviation unless it is associated with uh, some degree of vesicular blockage. That that is the problem. But look at that. Then again, we are saying what is the QS answer changes? Old anterolateral MI. Then again, any structural change? Left That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. Okay. What now, is the PR interval? PI interval, but not first degree heart block is not there. It's just marginal. Uh, no, well, the, the PR interval is about... What is the weight? Uh, it's 220 to 240 milliseconds. So Then it's first degree block as well. Yeah. So I'll make a comment that people who answer C, if you suddenly look at 2-3 AVF, looks like old mm -hmm. inferior MI, but there is a small R wave in this. And that takes away the diagnosis of inferior MI. This is not a key wave. Any negative component preceded by R wave is not a key wave. Please remember that. Second, I think I'll go more in favor of left anterior. This axis, is it right axis or extreme left axis? The question is, one of the criteria used for left anterior fascicular block is QR pattern. That is Q in lead one and a small R in lead three. That supports left anterior fascicular block than left. So those <laughs> possibilities are, so I think that uh, that makes probably the number four the most likely diagnosis. Uh, yes. So let's practice this. I think um, what I have one or two more ECGs and then we'll be done. This one, I think I've shown this ECG. Uh, uh, this will, I think we should look at it again and again. Um, uh, and another ECG that is always difficult for us is somebody comes with left bundle ST elevation and chest pain. This is not a chest pain patient. This patient just uh, in office ECG. Eighty-seven year old. This left band breast block. Okay. So uh nobody said right bundle, which is good. Um and then there was of course the issue of left bundle only. The question is the Q wave in lead one, AVL and lead B. Uh, V6 is not a Q, just small RS pattern. So any comment from Wadud is the master of this? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so the Q wave actually suggests there is MI. Yes, where is the location? In a normal person, if Q wave in one AVL is suggestive of lateral MI, but this in is presence of left bundle, I'll go for anterior MI. It is anterior MI. And because there is a hole in the lateral wall, and you pick up the septal negative EKG going away from it, from that V6, yeah. and it has been proven by autopsy finding. If I'll show you, this is a very old paper. I was probably, how old I was? I was two years old when this paper was published. And they did autopsy on left bundle and found that anteroceptal MI with left bundle, Q wave in lead one AVL and V6. 38 out of 39 patients had uh, this finding. So that's the that's um, finding. So if you see a, a Q wave in, I think there is one more. And then I, uh, this is, uh, oh, okay, actually, uh, how much time? What time is it? We have a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, this one and one more ECG. Mother Kissy, did she say? Did they can say?
আচ্ছা আমি একটা প্রোগ্রামে 10 মিনিটের ভিতর শেষ হবে ওই ওই সিসি থেকে ফোন করেছিল তো আমি কথা বলছি তাহলে 10 মিনিটের ভিতর শেষ হবে প্রোগ্রামটা ফ্যান্টাস্টিক বড দ্যাটস গুড রাইট আর খুব চমৎকারই আসছে দেখেন তো মেজরিটি অ্যানসারড হাই গ্রেড এবি ব্লক উইথ 3 টু 1 কার ইটস ইন্টারেস্টিং when we see 3 to 1 we always say, we say 2 to 1 hard block but 3 to 1 is a difficult term when we use 3 to 1 we should say 3 to 1 conduction that means out of 3 1 conducted so this is a high grade complete hard block with ventricular escape is a possibility however if you look at the rhythm strip there is a p wave before each qrs and two non conduct and that pr interval is constant that takes away the complete heart block. Sinus bradycardia was an option, and whoever said sinus bradycardia, um, if you go back, it's, when you see any heart rate low, always look for, see if there is any other P wave. I mean, it, it is possible. I have seen a heart rate of 28 in an athlete, um, but this patient has heart rate, he's 73 year old, unlikely, but can happen. But you see, there's a P wave, and there is another P wave, and there is another P wave. So that's excellent. And then we'll do the last ECG and then we'll be done for today. Okay. Two physicians said atrial fibrillation with right bundle. One physician said sinus rhythm, sinus arrhythmia, first degree AP block. And these are all options because uh, there is a degree of irregularity. And majority said number C. So if you look at the irregularity, there is a pattern to it. Little slower faster, slower, and faster. And that takes away atrial fibrillation, most likely. And then I can see something which looks like a P wave. You can see in lead, this rhythm strip is V1 and 2, you can see this P wave, and possibly another P wave, another P wave. So atrial fibrillation is out of the question. Sinus rhythm with sinus arrhythmia, first degree V block is an option. Wenkeva is an option, and supraventricular. But if we look at it, my arrow is here, there's a P wave, there is first degree AV block, and then there is another P wave. Why this is the P wave? Because if you look at the previous T wave, there is no distortion of the end of the T wave. And there is a distortion, that means this is the P wave. That's PR is prolonged. And then again, there is another P wave, PR is prolonged, another P wave, long. And now question is, I think there is a P wave over here, which is conducted. And there is a P wave here, which did not conduct. And then it comes back to short. Let's look at it. I have drawn the picture. I say there is a P wave here. Am I imagining it? Look at, I have expanded it. This QRS has a positive component and the one before does not have. That means, this is because of the PO. And the same thing is in lead two also. You see, there is a something in before the QRS complex which is not here. So that was the P wave. And then what's happening? I've drawn the line, P, conducted QRS, P, longer interval, P, longer interval. This P goes to this one. And here I had to make my, use my imagination based on timing because this timing was 
640 millisecond. And if I make 640, there is a P wave inside the QRS complex, which I think conducted, and this P wave did not conduct. And then it goes back to Wenke Bach law. Any, body, any, so please men, remember this thing. Anytime you see group beating, consider all these possibilities that sinus arrhythmia, Wenkeba AV block, or sinus neutral Wenkeba, which is a very unusual phenomena uh, to happen. And then this is the same patient um, uh, on a different day. You can now, it's a little bit easier. Um, PR, PR longer, PR blocked, first degree, uh, borderline first degree AV block, and then a prolonged block. So this is the same patient, so Wenkeba. And the other thing is that, of course, there are a few other findings. I'm glad that you all picked up that there is a old septal myocardial infarction because you see there is a key wave in V1. I, V2, I don't know lead position, but V3 clearly has this, so old septal myocardial infarction. Um, and again, what was mentioned that uh, you can see this pattern, but this is not in MI because it doesn't present, it's not present in two and ABF, it's just a Q, possible key wave in lead three. Um, any other, unless anybody has any other comment, we'll, um, I'll finish here. Sir, assalamu alaikum. Professor, assalamu alaikum. Sir, actor, uh, question chilo. Last week, after patient, uh, the patient came with uh, chest pain, LVV, and ST elevation in 2-3 AVF. The patient was admitted in uh, under Professor Golam Adam, sir. And he uh, opened it for inferior MI, and basically it came out as inferior MI as the patient underwent C, uh, CAG. So, uh, and he also showed a, a paper uh, that in presence of inferior, in presence of LVV, if there is inferior MI, the ST elevation can be seen and interpreted as inferior MI in presence of LVV, which cannot we comment as anterior MI. Confident. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if you look, can you see my slide? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. So if you look at this one, there is some ST elevation in V2 and V3. This patient is not having chest pain. So this has left bundle, right? But look at 2, 3 AVF. It's, it's not elevated. So if this patient came with ST elevation, yes, I, I support that notion that yes, if there is a elevation patient having chest pain, that uh, uh, it, it probably can probably point, uh, tell about the um, inferior MI. Um, Wadud, any comment on that? Sir, we uh, yet a uh, criterion, the modified criterion take into ST elevation any uh, discordant, uh, uh, concordant segment is positive for MI. But it yes. can be which valve. Yeah. You cannot always say which wall is actually. Uh, inferior, uh, <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, his explanation was that because of involvement of inferior wall, and which is prominently seen in uh, limb leads, and the uh, LBV doesn't impact the limb lead that much than the chest lead. So we can, can we comment inferior MI in presence of LBV okay. confidently? Can I, can I interrupt? For left bundle yes, block, to call it left bundle block, you have to have QRS comp implicated in limb leads. One, yes. So limb lead is always involved. Chest lead is also always involved. But mm -hmm. if there is ST elevation, concordant ST elevation, it's MI, acute MI. You may not be sure which wall is involved, but it's acute ST elevated MI. You can take the patient to the cath lab, or you can go for thrombolysis. You can be sure of that by seeing the echo. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, any, any, any comment from Rafik, sir, regarding this particular issue? No, I, I think, I mean, these are difficult uh, ECGs, as always. Um, but if the patient is having ongoing chest pain and uh, you... Uh, you see the change, you have to take it for face value um, and use that as a diagnosis. I mean, it, it, the question is, if the same patient comes without chest pain, came for a totally different reason, then of course it's a different story. But somebody coming with chest pain, we have to clearly think about it. I mean, same applies if you look at the Garbosa criteria and then there is a modified criteria 
where they decrease the um, amplitude of the elevation, you pick up more cases, but you look, look, lose specificity a little bit, but the sensitivity goes up. So that's true for any kind of thing. And the audience and uh, or everybody must remember that there are gray areas in medicine. And that's where we come in as a clinical uh, clinician and talking to the patient and making the right decision at that point, which is very, very important. Now, finally, we did it in Duplastry and Proximal RCA is reverse couraged. Just uh, one thing, to take the patient to the cat lab, Ajum has done that nicely. No, 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 no. <laughs> Tushar, can you send me those ECGs, please? I, I'll send it to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Ajum. Uh, with with the, also picture of the angiogram. Okay. I don't know the video, just the occluded RCA video and RCA, so. Video clips. Okay, thank you. Sir, we, uh, can we, Atta, sir, can we, can we show the ECG of the week? If uh, Ribu, just you show the ECG and if uh, I've I've got the ECG, I can show it. Okay. Sir. But if uh, just that is the ECG, sir. I think this uh, this is the ECG uh, of the week, and this was sent and posted by uh, Dr. Mukadesh Susan Sadi, and I think. The time is over. I, I think it does not need any discussion as because this was actually case of the atrial flutter. Is there any comment about the diagnosis atrial flutter? Is there is there is no comment? We cannot actually uh, close. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sadi is not available here. And this is the ECG uh, posted by him. And uh, this is the atrial flutter actually post CABG case. Is there any uh, comment about the diagnosis, anyone participant or uh, panelist? So okay, I, I, I just make a comment for the audience, whoever answered. <clears throat> First of all, it looks typical right bundle pattern that we looked at so far. The, if you look at the ECG, it is very difficult to say it is flatter or not, but look at the first two beat in lead two and lead three. In lead two, immediately after the keyword is complete, you can see a negative component and then another negative component. That is the clue for the flutter. And then as you move forward, you cannot because the rate is faster. And at that point, you have to just use your imagination. So please remember that you can see the flutter wave in, in the beginning of the tracing. So in the lead V1, in the middle part of the, that is in between the two QRSs, are these the P waves, sir? That is the flutter wave. Yes, but here, the heart rate 128, that P wave, I cannot see a second P wave. So let's say if I make a diagnosis of sinus tachycardia with first degree AV block, is also a possibility, right? Here, I mean, you can see the P wave immediately after the T wave. And then if I call it a first degree AV block, so if somebody answers that, I have to accept it also. Don't sir, you think then, so? Yes, sir. Sir, then whether you can tell it, sir, that the initial part of the ECG shows the atrial flutter, then it is converted into sinus tech. It, it is unlikely because we have a long rhythm strip. And it, at then at that point, if we take double of that, uh, that flutter wave, it will match exactly with the RR interval. That's the way you tell that it did not convert. So in the beginning of the tracing, what we are calling flutter wave, if we take two of those flutter wave, that rate will be exactly same as the rate later on. That means that was atrial flutter. And then when you use that, then you can say, yes, that wave that I'm seeing in V1 is, a, is one of the flutter wave. And the second flutter wave is inside the QRS complex. Sir, in P3, P3 if you look at the T waves, the T waves are double picked. Yes. And if you look at the V4, before the keyword is complete, there is a small, very sharp, very small, very near uh, P wave looking like uh, picture. So yes. that gives two P waves for every keyword is complex. Right. That gives yes. to the diagnosis that this could be likely flatter. Yes. But the problem is, if you remember my Wenke by ECG. Yes. I showed one complex without that wave and one with the wave. That tells you that's not part of the QRS complex. But here, 
I can use my imagination into that. Yes. So if I did not have the beginning of this ECG, I could not have definitively said this is atrial flutter with 2 to 1 conduction. I have to entertain all those diagnoses. Sir, yes. then, sir then for the discussion purpose, that is the atrial flutter, sinus tech, Atrial yes. take all we should yes. also. This atrial take also, sir. Yes, of course. Atrial take. Of right. course, you have to keep all those into diagnosis. And one of the clue, clue will be that if we take a prolonged rhythm strip and the heart rate stays exactly at 128, doesn't change. That will take away sinus tachycardia, most likely. So I think this is the thing about that ECG that 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 is we cannot just overstretch ourselves. We have to entertain yes. the possibilities. Yes. Yes. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you we sir. can con conclude the session. Uh, may I request uh, Abdul Wadud Chaudhary, sir, to conclude the session, sir. Wadud, sir, please. I think today we have very interactive, very in involved ECG session. And the answer pattern shows that actually uh, all the efforts of our teachers is paying okay. off. Yes, sir. People are making proper diagnosis, thinking in the proper way, and analyzing the things in a more subtle and more accurate, more, uh, I should say, confident way. And that's the beauty of these sessions. And we are really grateful to Rafik sir, Hafiz Bhai and all the other panelists who are contributing to these sessions. And the expression of opinions, we differ with each other, give our opinion why I am saying so, and again, counter this intellectual battle is so beautiful. These, these are sharpening our wits, sharpening our mind, and also making us more adept at diagnosing and analyzing the ECGs. Thank you, everybody. So, Firoz, Firoz, yes, as an announcement for our next Saturday session, as a, as a Rubik sir, sir yes. the same with the December month. The, in, the, in the month of the December, our discussion will be the same pattern. And the next Saturday, our uh, presenters, Dr. Khaled Moshin, possibly he's here. Dr. Khaled? Yes. Yes, yes Khaled Moshin, get ready. We are waiting for your uh, presentation next 20, Saturday. Only 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 20, 22 minutes for you. Kanis Fatima? Good. Good. Kanis. Kanis Fatima? Yes, sir. Kanis Fatima. Actually, we want yes, to a comment from you about the uh, Chaudhuri Hafiz, one of the ECG that is a very ECG that was discussed about the uh, sepsis and the cardiogenic shock. Actually, actually we want to take a comment. मध्य and another presenter our next day that is the aisha kader all right so khalid mohsin kanis fatima and aisha kader actually we are waiting for the three distinguished faculties in the next saturday kanis nasrullah many many thanks 
you initiated the discussion to an excellent presentation nice ecc actually showed us kaise nasrullah thank you thank you boss ile to vigorous alochana hobe ecc te thank you i think a mukaddas session sadi sari je hoto eta as but uh, okay. i i i yeah atar bhai miss firoz kena ami firoz er student hote chai to amar khobor kohoni kokhono hor to firoz er lecture ke jodi kokhono মানে সুযোগ হয় আমি মানে আরেকবার দাও অনুরোধ করছেন ইনশাআল্লাহ ইনশাআল্লাহ সাদি ভাই ইজ উইথ আস আচ্ছা সাদি কিছু লাইক ওনার যে গানের অনুষ্ঠান আরেকবার সাদি ভাই আপনার আচ্ছা আপনার ডায়াগনোসিস নিয়ে তো ডিসকাশন শুনলে ডু হ্যাভ এনি কমেন্টস अबाउट योर ডায়াগনোসিস ইজ ইট ডায়াগনোসিস ইউ হ্যাভ গট দা ট্রিটমেন্ট এর ডায়াগনোসিস উইথ উইথ ফলো আপ ইসিজি দা پیشنট প্রেজেন্টেড অ্যাজ উইথ অ্যাকচুয়াল ফিব্রিলেশন ইসিজি ও দ্যাট ওয়াজ অ্যাকচুয়াল ফিব্রিলেশন डायगनोसिस is the atrial flutter atrial flutter but we have also some differential diagnosis that is a sinus tech or the atrial tech do you have any comments about this differential diagnosis my differential diagnosis was also first degree av block sinus tech with first degree av block at the very difficult disease that was maybe but in that ecg we do not have any p wave that's upright in lead to uh, without an upright t wave wave in lead to uh, we actually cannot entertain the diagnosis of first degree heart block that's the problem atar bhai yeah, you want no, yeah, yeah i am i am absolutely agree with you actually the t was inverted in the lead to Lead. that is the academic discussion that is the uh, sinus tag is a differential diagnosis but uh, we can uh, that is a uh, we can exclude the possibilities because of the inverted t waves in the lead too it could be left atrial rhythm right it could be atrial tachycardia it could be atrial flutter but that's a very interesting ecg sadhvi thank you sadhvi thank you very much actually we missed to sadhvi last two sessions but actually we are waiting for you and we are happy to have you see your face sadhvi bhai every time actually you are welcome okay okay thank you sir sir may i add one comment yes, sir yes sir sir please yeah. regarding the first ecg of our sensors actually uh, everything we can uh, correlate with the hypokalemia as because this hypokalemia may lead to the rhabdomyolysis this rhabdomyolysis may lead to the arf and as well as the cardiac arrest all, all these things we can uh, Compile under the single headlines. That is the hypokalemia may lead to so everything. Uh, sir, it was hyperkalemia actually. Rhabdomyolysis can give rise. No, give sir, 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 the, the, the hypokalemia induced yeah. may sometimes may induce the rhabdomyolysis. Mokka mokka mokka. Ki baat kora jay? But the, the EKG sir. because it was mentioned that remember there is Osborne wave that that we need to recognize. and this hypothermia was mimicking our problem was that the patient had a cardiac arrest but post cardiac arrest it was sold to us as stemi so our thing is that tease out that what is going on but yes uh, actually this patient did have hyperkalemia uh, because of the rhabdo and then 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 got the uh, bicarb and all that there was hypocalcemia hypomagnesemia uh, I, i i don't know atar bhai whether you noticed there was little bit qt prolongation also right exactly please bhai my question was uh, i would have gone for temporary pacing the correction of metabolic acidosis and waiting uh, instead of deciding it's a case of uh, uh, st st elevated mi what did you do actually i was muted so um but the question is if the heart rate is 50s and the blood pressure is maintained with little bit of dopamine 
uh, then you can buy time and correct all the, and if it gets worse, we have this uh, pacer pad for external pacing. And then if we need to go, we can go and put a temporary wear. But the patient did well from the rhythm point of view. He's lucky to have, he, he still had sinus rhythm. That was very lucky of him. Exactly. And then uh, another political thing, if you put a temporary wear, the ICU will say, now you take care of the patient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Sure. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank yes. you, Drew, and Dr. Dr. Yeah. And Thank you, sir. Thank you all the other panelists, Dr. Asad, uh, Professor Maski Vizidas, Professor Moshi Noshen, Abdul Al Jamil Bhai, Professor MG Azam, and also Professor Jalal Sar was with us, actively participated. Jalal Sar was superb. And Dr. Khalegu yeah. yeah. also came back from Corona. No, Khalegu so, is actually here. Asa. Khalegu, after Gala was Shunai, then.